welcome everyone really delighted uh, you're all with us um all still with us indeed um for this session can data be used for good the ethics of research so for those of you who were with us yesterday maybe joined us at the drinks reception you might have heard uh, my code well my boss claire talking about how uh, important it is and how glad we are that we're able to partner with various organizations uh, to help make this festival happen and make the various debates and discussions uh, as part of this festival happen and it takes uh, uh, a certain amount of guts and gumption to as an external organization to partner with a festival that is all about uh, open debate and free discussion uh, and to a time obviously when live events and what are only just starting happening anyway and so it's really we're really glad to be sort of relaunching uh, the public sphere with the support of certain organizations and the most the most important one for today really for me and for certainly for this session is uh, ADR UK who will be hearing um, Emma uh, from ADR and she'll tell you probably in better terms than me what they're all about but essentially um, my very layman's perspective on it is that there is of course and this is the setup for the session as well is that ev almost everything we do as you'll know and as is a lot is made of now leaves data a trail of data in computers and hard drives all around and governments and public bodies have loads of this from god knows how long and it's kind of just sitting there and the inspiration behind adr uk and other kinds of organizations is that maybe we could do something useful with it uh something that improves people's lives that joins up things and makes our lives easier and uh happier and all the rest of it so emma i'm sure we'll tell you a bit more about that later but that's basically the basis and the inspiration for this session which is that as i presented it sounds like a unambiguous good thing but of course it throws up lots of questions and challenges around privacy around consent um, around the use of maybe as if you read the blurb ahead of coming here when say private companies get involved in uh, using that data people have heard stories in the press about Google or Palantir and other shady sounding organizations getting uh, involved and so it throws up lots of questions and challenges how can we use that data for good without uh, and sort of manage and mitigate the various risks and moral quandaries that are thrown up by that. So um, we've got a great, really great panel to help us navigate that question. Um, and I'll introduce them briefly in the order that they're going to speak. So first speaking on my far right is Tracy Follows. She's the founder and CEO of Future Made. She's the author of a really great book that's on sale downstairs uh, in Assembly Hall for a very good price called The Future of You, Can Your Identity Survive? 21st century technology. It's a really great uh, book. There's a great introduction to lots of themes. I do urge you to go and buy a copy and read it. Um, and Tracy, I mean, Tracy uh, in the longer bar you'll see described and is described in the press and in the media as a futurist. And I had no idea what that was and it sounded kind of a bit of a shady term. But when we started uh, speaking with Tracy and I were enlightening us about what's going on in the future, I kind of understood what it was, what it meant and what it was all about. So really delighted to be joined by Tracy. Um, speaking next is Emma Gordon, Dr. Emma Gordon, who's, as I say, the director of ADR uh, UK. Um, and uh, I've introduced them to you in the work that they do. And uh, we're really delighted, as I say, that they're partnering with us to help bring this discussion to the festival. Speaking next is Guy Herbert, who's sitting next to me. He's the general secretary of no to id um, His biography states he's the originator of the phrase database state. Do you get a trademark when you sort of... <laughs> yeah. when you, I, I'm I, still I, waiting <laughs> for the uh, OUP to, uh, to credit me. But, uh, but database state in the, in, in the sense of the, 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 the state using data to, to attempt to control people okay. rather than the, 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 the position a database finds itself in, which is an older use. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I should get the panel to introduce themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. It's much easier than meeting it. But the, the, the other interesting thing, as well as being director of this uh, campaign group, Note to ID, the interesting thing, really interesting thing about Guy is that he sits on the intersection of sort of arts and science, as it were, because in his professional life, is involved in publishing... Um, well, involved in publishing. And so for me, that's interesting. And I'm always interested in people who sit at the intersection of sciencey questions like data and then arts questions like publishing and all the rest of it. So uh, really delighted to be joined by Guy. Um, and then last, but by no means least, is Samandra Hartness. Uh, she'll be known to many of you as a journalist, a writer, a broadcaster on uh, BBC Radio and elsewhere. She's uh, a couple of programs you might have caught was one was future proofing another one is how to disagree she's also a comedian um which i know now puts pressure on her to say something funny so we won't <laughs> ask her to but and most relevantly perhaps for this discussion she's the author of a great book called big data does size 
matter. Um, and an interest, always interesting feature of the Battle of Ideas is Tamandra enlightening us on the various things going on uh, in the world of tech and data. So really delighted to be joined by Tamandra. Um, this session will run, as you should be familiar with various Battle of Ideas panels by now. Uh, we'll have some short introductions uh, in the order in which I introduce them, and then it'll be very much out to you, and you can feel free to ask questions, and we'll try and clarify them. You can have a point of view um, and disagree and take issue with each other, but the, it's a chance for us all to get to grips with something that's happening, and it's up to us, as is the way in Battle of Ideas sessions, to try and shape it and get a handle on it. So uh, anyway, quite enough, I think, from me. I'll hand over to Tracy for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much for the kind invite to be part of this panel. Um, OK. So can our data be used for good? Um, no doubt it is possible um, for our data to be used for good, but will it be used for good? Um, that's what I'd like to know. And so I'm going to use my spidey powers, my futurist powers, <laughs> um, to maybe uh, take us out into the future a bit, to envision what the future will be like, and then we can try and re-perceive some of the decisions we need to make today. Um, in 20 to 25 years' time, we'll have lots of new personal health data, um, like that from the brain-machine interface. So that will be pretty prevalent in the workplace um, by 2040, um, 2045 probably. Um, we'll be able to thought control machines in the office or at home, much like super soldiers in the military can already thought control their weapons. We'll also probably have some hive mind or collective consciousness where our minds are connected to a server by which we can offload tasks onto a bit of extra computing space. Uh, we can perhaps store some memories um, and increase our mental capacity like downloading a new language. Thank God. <laughs> um, we'll also be using something like Google Mind Docs where our brains are connected with each other so we can share our thoughts and ideas without having to speak or write them. Outside of cognition, the Internet of Bodies uh, will have been long, es long established. So this is where our medical data um, follows what the World Economic Forum have called the solidarity approach to health governance. Um, that means sharing our biological data for the common good. Um, that's actually already outlined in plenty of documents, but I do like to refer people to the um, 2002 report, going that far back, called Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance, which was issued under the Bush administration. Um, now, this suggests converging all kinds of technologies like biotechnology, information technology, nanotechnology, lots of technologies, uh, cognitive science, um, to improve the mental health and physical performance of humans. Of course, that's to help people live longer, healthier lives, but even to make our populations immune to the threat of biological warfare. Um, you see, I've long held a view that build back better does not so much mean build back a better environment for humans to live in, as much as it means build back better humans to suit the environment. And I think that's the agenda of a lot of personal biological data collection um, that's going to be served in the future for the public good, for the political good. Now, Increasingly, the West seems to be looking to China for a future model of an efficient, stable, well-run state, the future technological state. Well, China just brought in um, the data security law, actually, which looks at data protection not from the perspective of individuals and our personal data, but from the perspective of national security. So rather, how could data be used for public harm? How can we safeguard ourselves against the public, public harm? And I get the impression that the West is quite happy to adopt a similar kind of mindset. In April, the UK government announced the establishment of the UK Health Security Agency. It's a department whose aim is, to all intents and purposes, very good, it's to guard against infectious diseases. Um, but it doesn't actually define public harm. What's more, it states that we need much deeper integration between health protection science and at-scale response capabilities, and we need to think radically about the capabilities and capacity we'll need as a nation to protect our population from future threats. This is the bit. We need to consider how best to engage with citizens and drive behaviour change in the 21st century. Before long, you'll be told that based on this data, whether anonymised or not, you need to stop eating meat, stop driving that car, 
stop thinking certain thoughts. Um, and with these technologies that I outlined at the start, you know, behavior change is going to be so much easier and more plausible. Mm -hmm. So th I think this is a worry because your personal data is actually not your property, it's you. There is a legal precedent for this coming out of the Riley versus California case in the US where the judge ruled um, in that case involving an iPhone that your personal data, it emanates from your phone, it is literally an extension of you. So to summarize what to do. Well, last week lawmakers in Chile approved a new law establishing the rights to personal identity, free will, and mental privacy, becoming the first country in the world to legislate on neurotechnology that can manipulate people's minds, record people's mental data, or even modify it. One of its proponents said, this is the start of a global assessment on how technology should be used for the good of humanity, adding that technology must be at the service of people with respect for physical and mental integrity. The psychology of the self and the biology of the self is about to be joined by a third dimension, the technology of the self. I have control of the first two, but I'm not sure I'll get control of the latter. In the emerging biosecurity state, I'd argue that I really need to. So I'll leave you with this one thought, that whilst data might be the new oil, data sovereignty is the real prize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Emma, you can tell us a bit about how you're avoiding some of those challenges <laughs> raised, by, raised by Tracy. Thanks very much. So I'm coming to this debate from the perspective of having worked as a researcher across a range of sectors. So I've worked in the academic sphere and also in the civil service, in the public service. Uh, but I'm also coming to this debate as a UK citizen who is a parent and a grandparent thinking all the time about how government and industry use my data and that of my family. But in my career, I've consistently found pe people wanting to make better use of data for public good, but not being able to fully realize this because systems and structures aren't set up to facilitate this happening in safe and secure ways. I now lead the program called ADI UK, that's Administrative Data uh, Research UK, that is all about joining up administrative data across different parts of government, across all four countries of the UK, so that this can be used to support research in the public good. So when I talk about administrative data, this is data that's created when people interact with public services that keep records to carry out their day-to-day -day work. So this is not creating a new system of um, data collection. It's data that government is already uh, paying uh, to, to create, essentially, but it's putting that to, to use for the public good. So although not originally created for research, this data has great potential to provide insights to help policymakers and others, civil society bodies, charities, lots of organisations, to make better informed decisions. So we're a partnership of government and academic groups across all four nations, and a big part of our work is around relationship and trust building. So that's between government and uh, external researchers, but it's also about with the public. And we're working to create these linked research data sets and make them available to re researchers in very specific and controlled ways through our network of trusted research environments. And doing this in ways that maintain and build public trust is crucial, because if we don't do this, we don't maintain the social contract to use this data for public good. And I work at the Economic and Social Research Council. We fund a lot of research. Uh, we've done a literature review, and we've got a huge programme of work around public engagement. And we know that the, the public is generally in favour of us doing this type of work, as long as three conditions are met. So the research has to be in the public interest. Privacy and security concerns have to be addressed. And there has to be trust and transparency. So we have to be able to talk about what we're doing. And please do visit our stand downstairs if you want to find out more about how we're doing this. And um, we've got people uh, that will tell you all about the great work that we're doing with public panels and community representative panels and much, much more. But this isn't about creating a big brother society. The data we make available to research is, is done in very controlled conditions, as I said. It's all built around tried and tested principles. 
So crucially, none of the individual level data we make available to researchers can be taken out of these trusted environments in that form. And there's no IDs attached to the attribute data. So there's no names, no addresses or other identifying information. And these controlled environments need to be accredited to very high standards for us to be allowed to deposit data in them. So this means that research, for example, can be carried out on how children with disabilities have fared as a result of the pandemic in terms of their educational outcomes compared to other children. So better services can be designed to support those children moving forward. But that data can't be used for operational purposes. So for example, you can't then go, a government can't then go and knock on the, the door of those children and families because uh, the, the information, the um, identifiers are no longer attached to the data. And we're also doing work to understand how farming communities are being impacted by Brexit and climate change in collaboration with farming communities. And we're also understanding how to reduce reoffending and, and improve the, the criminal justice system in collaboration with charities and people working with w both victims of crime and uh, perpetrators of crime. So in terms of engaging with big tech companies, I don't personally think that they should be given any kind of preferential access to data. All access requests need to be considered on the same basis and all need to pass this public good test. That doesn't mean to say government shouldn't be able to commission their data services, just that they shouldn't get preferential access to be able to analyze the data that's held on those platforms. And I agree government should be challenged to be open and transparent about what they do and what they plan to do with data they hold about people. And there are now some great examples across the UK of how we do this in meaningful ways. Interestingly, most in Wales and Scotland, I'd say, but Northern Ireland and uh, Whitehall departments are very much catching up on this. So government should also get much better about championing the massive public good that can come out from making this type of data available to researchers. And this should be part of a national conversation and not just in times of pandemic. And by normalizing this engagement between government and the public, we can avoid the missed use of data for public good, as well as the misuse of data. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks a lot, Emma. Uh, guys, some opening thoughts. Okay, uh, the subject before us contains, I think, a lot of conceptual traps. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear a great deal about public good, but it is very, very hard to define. People behave as if they uh, were, it was completely obvious what public good is. Uh, and it was completely uh, available to the people doing the work uh, to determine what, is, what public good is. It's a sort of governmentalist uh, uh, assumption that governments know what's best for us uh, 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 and, uh, and researchers are, are unbiased, uh, have, have, have no preset agendas. Uh, and and are without without moral stain. Uh, even that itself is a trap, yeah. uh, because uh, in in, uh, in in C. S. Lewis's famous words, "Those who torment us for our own good will mm -hmm. torment us forever," because they do so with the, the permission of their own consciences. Uh, there are more traps than that, I'm afraid. Uh, there are traps concerned with law, with policy, with uh, the structures, asymmetric uh, structures that are, are embedded in this, in this, uh, these ideas uh, that we we need to be aware of and are simply glossed over in, in many cases. Uh, let Let's think. To begin with, about about the question of data that is being collected for administrative purposes yeah. that the government has paid for. Um, so we'll, we'll come out to you later. Re so re you re reply. Regardless of uh, of, uh, of un under what circumstances they paid for it, uh, we we ha we have a legal principle uh, which is is being eroded as we speak. Uh, 
uh, called Ultraviris, uh, the idea that uh, as a part of the rule of law, government is not entitled to do things with uh, that it that it has not been uh, given appropriate warrant for. Uh, what we're doing here when we say the information is available, we should use it, uh, is uh, so throwing aside that principle. Information has been gathered for one purpose. It is then being repurposed retrospectively. Yeah. We'll come out to you. It's, like, it's fine. It's being repurposed retrospectively uh, in circumstances that were not envisaged at the time it was collected. So there is a strange retrospection of being, being uh, forced on us there. Uh, and, and this has actually been recognized since 1999, I believe, uh, in the re report of the EM Boy and what was then the Department of Constitutional Affairs. Uh, I think they kept, they kept on changing the, the, the naming of the, uh, of the department at one time, uh, where it was recognized that barriers to data sharing, as they were called, included uh, ultra vires, uh, common law confidentiality, uh, and and uh, and uh, other more more technical things, but but the the idea that that, that we can maintain a, a simple direction, a simple flow of time, once we start to delve backwards in, into data that already exists for some reason, uh, is 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 difficult to maintain and difficult to understand. The procedural justification for these things is odd. Uh, another problem is a policy problem. Uh, the policy problems arise because you say you're doing things for research, but why are you researching? In order to, in order to, uh, to create policies based on research, generally speaking, there's a circularity. You, you, you know what you want to do before you, uh, before you uh, dig into the research. So there's a confirmation bias there. Uh, there's also a strange problem call, caused by the availability of data. If you're simply doing research on data that exists for some purpose, then the criteria by which that data has been gathered uh, are, is, is deterministic of what you are able to do with that, with that data subsequently. Your, the questions you ask of the data are actually limited by the, by the manner in which the data has, has, has been collected. So that, that's the reverse of my, of my, my issue with, uh, with uh, the uh, with, with retrospection as, as, as to use, there's also a problem with, with projecting forward from the data that has been collected. So, so th this is an area that is rife with problems, not just on the, on the, uh, on the basis of, of, of the legitimacy of the process, but, but also on understanding what we're actually doing. Great. Thanks, Guy. Thanks. Useful. Lots of useful things thrown up there, and I'm sure with the audience's help, we'll get some examples of that um, as well later. But uh, Samantha. Okay. Um, I'm I, disclosing this partly for, <laughs> partly, I guess, for ethical reasons, and just because uh, I think it might frame uh, where I'm coming at this from. I'm actually, as a member of the Royal Statistical Society, uh, I am. I'm on the committee of their data ethics and governance section, and I'm also, I think through that, I am on the advisory group for the Secure Research Service, which is um, connected with the UK Research Councils, which is, uh, it's one of the technical solutions to how you can make various data available to researchers while safeguarding privacy. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, 
Can I? This is a rather cheeky show of hands. Uh, how many of the people in the room have read Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism? It's about that thick. You will remember if you've read it. No, All okay. of it. <laughs> two thirds. <laughs> two th I'll give you two, two thirds. thirds of my hand. Yeah. Wow, mm. respect. Oh, wow. Um, uh, how many people have read Volume One of Capital? by Karl Marx. Okay, more people. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> now I'm asking this because I I am rather cheekily going to use a, a very loose and, uh, and highly criticizable term which I've invented, which is data fetishism. I, I think mm. that sometimes we are in danger of treating data as if it is stuff. As if it is, I mean, you know, the phrase oil has already been used, sometimes it's compared to water, occasionally to infrastructure and I think we are in danger sometimes of treating it as if it has a material existence in its own right and and I think that's a mistake I think that we do better to think about data as a kind of snapshot of relationships of human relationships either between people directly or between people in institutions uh, sometimes uh, it's kind of a relationship between you and your own activities Sometimes some of the data that your mobile phone collects will be literally, it's a relationship between you and how much walking you do or whatever. And I, I think that is a much more useful way of thinking about data because I think it, it frees us from some of the, the, the traps that we get in, which may be slightly different ones to the ones that, that you raised. Um, so I think, I, I think there are two connected but slightly separate things at play here. I think one of them is, is quite a technical conversation about Data has been collected for one purpose, which is administrative data. It's, it's been collected in order for departments to do things, to give you a driving license, to give you benefits, to keep track of what state your council housing is in or whatever. Uh, and and can that data then be used for another purpose? And, and as Guy says, there, there are various problems with that, with saying you you knew that your data was being collected when you claimed a benefit but you didn't in any way consent to it being used for research this is this is a constant problem for researchers who want to repurpose data uh, and yet it's one of the promises of big data is precisely that you can ask a question of data that was not the plan from whoever collected it for whatever purpose you can you can you can repurpose it you can combine it with other data in new ways and thereby ask new questions and get new answers that's one of its enormous potentials um, that has got us all sorts of I mean you know medical data is the very obvious one but but, but various benefits um, but then the relationship on the basis of which the data was first collected is you know that's gone and there's, and there's a new relationship here one of the things I think is happening is that there are various technical solutions being developed to try and enable the data to be used for for public good. Um, I, I, it's quite interesting that you raise that because that was one of the things I raised on the committee when I was the advisory group. I was like, yeah, we keep using public good. What, what, what do we mean by that exactly? And they're like, ah, good, glad you asked. We've actually, we've, we've done a whole lot of work on this and here's, here's our thoughts. So that, you know, that is... That is a whole discussion. Um, so there are technological solutions which are designed to variously give individuals control over their own data. So there's, there's various things in the offering at the moment. Tim Berners-Lee has a new idea for the internet, which is that instead of it being a kind of interconnected web where data shoots around all over the place, you, you have data that's about you and it lives in a little little cell, a kind of virtual box, and then you you actively have to consent for other people to use it, whether they send kind of send in the question uh, without seeing the data, which is the trusted research environment model, uh, or whether you say, okay, you can have you can have all my exercise data and my mood data for the last year for your research on whether exercise boosts mood or whatever. So that and the trusted research environment uh, is another version of that, in a sense, it's a collective version of that, where you know you have a lot of data, some of which is really sensitive, some of which is identifiable in its current form. You want to allow researchers to come and ask questions of it, uh, but you don't want them to just like take the whole lot home and be able to rifle through people's very personal data. So you, you kind of keep it in a virtual box and people come. I now have this ridiculous vision in my mind that it's like a convent 
and all the data is locked inside and you come and someone opens a little hatch in the big wooden door and there's a grating and you, you have your question and you slide it in under the hatch. And then a week later, you come and knock again and the, and the same nun comes back and slides the answers out. That is not literally how it works, obviously. <laughs> but that's kind of in my mind, the, the relationship between the question and the research, research and the data. So there are, there are these various technological fixes. But I think the other question is more difficult and more interesting. And that's the one that has been variously raised, which is... It, it, back to the question of power and relationships like well who has who has the power who's the control but what is the purpose of this research and i think we this is why i think i worry about us getting too hung up on data as stuff as if it's material it's like who has access to my data it's not your data it's data about you it's like you know you walk down the street and people collect data about you walking around like everything in life is data fine you use your oyster card on the tube london transport are not going to stop collecting data on who's on their tubes just because you suddenly have all your data in a personal box and that's not going to work data about you will continue to be collected the question is what are the consequences of that and how much control and power do we have over the consequences of it and that's where i think we need to pay attention because you know you can collect data about me but but what matters to me is the consequences of that. What matters to me is, yeah, do you collect data and put it together and then come back and say, oh, well, sorry, bad luck. You know, the data says that you there's a link between drinking sugary drinks and having diabetes in 20 years and costing the government loads of money. Therefore, you know, we're going to ration or ban fizzy drinks or you're going to have to have a license or, or whatever. It's at that end that I care. So I think, in a sense, we need to relax a little bit about the data and get a bit more concerned about the policy. Great, thanks, Mike. All right, we've got a lot of uh, meaty questions to discuss, but with your help, we'll dig into them a bit more. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about a particular type of data, which is genetic data, because I think in the last 20 years, genome sequencing has become so cheap that in 10, 20 years' time, it's going to be completely routine that when babies are born, they will have their full genome sequence. And this is a perhaps the most personal of personal data. This isn't just data about you. This is literally who you are that will exist and exist in um, for the NHS and potentially private companies to have. So I wonder if you have any opinions about what should be done about that. And also a relation question that is that it will actually mean that there's big data that people have about themselves that maybe they don't want to know. And so they're going to know their kind of risk for a lot of diseases that maybe they didn't want to know about in the first place. So is there a potential with big data that people will find things out about themselves they didn't actually want to know. How is data currently being misused? Sure, to the point. Hi, um, my question is for Guy Herbert. With the, um, you mentioned there was a strange misconception about using data for purposes outside of reasons why they were originally collected. Mm -hmm. And I just find this interesting because I feel like it's a a, an interesting way to think about what we do today and how it impacts us for the future. So for instance, perhaps when that data was originally collected, there weren't safeguards in place to use it in a safe and secure or responsible way. And we've seen this in other instances too. So for instance, medication that was made in the past can be used, have we found has been proven, some medication has been proven effective to future pandemics. And so I just wonder if the way that we think about things today, um, if what, how, what you have to say about that, and also whether you've thought about the missed use of data within this, um, within this framework. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question about something that was in the press earlier this year, which was about the NHS um, opt-out, um, specifically because the reason given was that it will allow people to have access to better medical treatment and research on the back of that. Um, I think firstly, it's very difficult for the public to engage with that because there wasn't a lot of information and people aren't very well informed when it comes to um, the data that your doctor or any NHS has access to. Um, and secondly, what does research count as? because the FT did a quite interesting analytical piece about who had accessed the data. And it was quite surprising to see names like McKinsey, 
who's a consultancy company, um, and um, Experian, who um, do credit <laughs> checks for your financials. Mm -hmm. And so even if it is for research, what are the parameters? Because people didn't necessarily consent for that. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's a great case setup. What we'll do, let's get the panel back because there's a lot on the table already. Then we'll, we'll come out. We've got loads of time left. So um, let's just go in the order we would. I mean, Tracy, any reflections, thoughts? I mean, I suppose my reflections on the genetic data, I, I agree with you. I think that's one of the um, big areas. Um, I know that Nuffield have been doing a lot of work on this around the ethics. There's loads of really great uh, policy papers, um, lots of debates about it. Um, but it's very obvious that, you know, you've got the pre-implantation genetic testing happening where before the um, before the embryo goes back into the woman's womb, obviously they're testing for diseases. That has quite quickly moved to a question of what sex would you like it to be? And then there's conversations around, I'm not saying here in the UK necessarily, but there are, and there, there are people who work in this area who are flagging it up um, as a, an, an area that needs more debate, needs more discussion, needs more st probably strict policies around it, very quickly you're getting to conversations about, well, what colour eyes do you want it to have, what colour hair, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just shocking to me in a way how quickly we've moved onto those conversations. There's a great book, I can't remember, it's James, um, oh, Hacking Darwin, it's James Metzl, Metzl, is it? Brilliant book about that. Um, it goes into a lot of uh, detail about it. Um, but I agree, I think that's like the fundamental area that I wish more people were engaged in. To me, it feels like it's a bit off on the side that it's not really um, being engaged in by the public, but I think that's partly because people are keeping it out of the public sphere, maybe. Um, the point about the data letting you know something you don't want to know, I think Yuval Harari's made this point about this kind of data um, kind of working out what you're like, what your predilections are, um, things about you, and then telling you things that could quite upset your life, if you like, and you don't want to know them. Where, where is the choice around that? And there is no answer to that, I think, at the moment. And he tends to use it in the commercial um, sense, you know, he's thinking, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever is, is tracking him and monitoring him. And then they start to sell him things and he starts to think, hang on, why are they selling me this? <laughs> it turns out they're making assumptions of him that he didn't realize. Um, but I think, I think it's a point well made and you can, um, you can adopt it in this discussion as well. But those are the two things I just want to, I would just reflect on those two points. Great, thanks Tracy. Uh, Emma, anything to pick up? Sure, yeah, and I agree, genetic data is, you know, a huge thing. And I personally don't think that that should be used for research without patient consent. And in terms of finding things out about yourself, the model that I'm talking about the, because the identifiers are no longer attached to the to the data when it's uh, analysed for research, they can't come back to you as an individual and tell you things that you don't want to know. That's not ethical. And in what the the question around in what ways are data being misused? I think there are ways that data has been misused by governments, and it's in my um, view, it's when the operational use of data, where the identifiers are attached to the data, um, is mixed up with the research use. And so um, there was the case of uh, Department for Education uh, a few years back sharing data with the Home Office, and then the Home Office tracking people down who didn't have permission to live in this country. And um, you know that, that that's the operational use of data. Um, I. I I'm talking about, you know, I think this vast amount of public good that could be used for re research of data, uh, using this data. But I think this is all why we need to have a much more open and honest debate with government and the public about the use of data. Because it's when things happen behind closed doors and the public is not involved in the conversation that I think the government takes missteps around this. And in terms of um, yeah, so I completely agree that there needs to be a better public debate around it. Um, and in terms of the NHS opt-out, I mean, you know, that you have to entirely respect that. My worry is that without the public uh, debate about the value of this data for research, though, there's huge groups of people 
that are not going to be um, represented in the data that is analysed. Uh, so I'm making massive sweeping assumptions here, but for example, if it just ends up being middle class white people in these data sets, we're not going to know about huge swathes of the rest of the society and the research isn't going to be valuable. That is a massive problem. I think we have to build trust with all communities in the UK to make sure that they understand the value of this. And we put those safeguards around the data so that it can't be used for operational purposes if we're saying it's going to be used for research. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, Guy, a few reflections. Yeah, I, I, I think before I come to the, 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 the questions from the floor, I, I think we need to be very careful when we talk about uh, things not being possible because they're not ethical. Ethics will always be uh, subordinated to expediency in, in, in the long run, and we need, we, we need to be aware of that. I'm fascinated by the idea that people think that, uh, that uh, genetic data is the most intimate information. I don't, I, 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 I don't agree that it is. Uh, I, I think had I an identical twin, we would be genetically identical, but we would have secrets from one another. <laughs> Uh, so, so that that's a, that's a, that's an interesting thing to reflect on. Genetics are not, as far as we know, uh, a, exact predictors of the future. Um, uh, the question that was directed direct uh, straight to me, I think, actually, it's you you, in my view, you have it back to front. It's not a problem that there were weren't safeguards on data when it was collected maybe years ago. The problem is more that in aid of various research and indeed uh, delivery of public services uh, roles uh, at, uh, across the world, but particularly in this country, the safeguards have been uh, deliberately demolished. And so the, the safeguards that existed 20 years ago no longer do so. Uh, if you look at the Digital Economy Act 2017, that very specifically undermines in the interests of, of, uh, of uh, certain uh, very broad categories of use, uh, the, 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 the data protection uh, and uh, uh, common law uh, protections on, on, on data. Without leading us down a rabbit hole of the law, like, uh, no. what, can you be specific? Like, yeah. what was eroded? Like, I'm what was eroded? Previously, you uh, previously we we didn't have uh, you you couldn't uh, overcome the the ultra vera's uh, presumptions in law that information with information collected for one purpose couldn't necessarily be used for another purpose without specific uh, legal uh, provision to do that. So they've talked about data sharing gateways, and that really is a rabbit hole. Nobody knows how many of those there are. Um, but uh, the, the Digital Economy Act, uh, very little of it is to do with the economy at all, um, provided that information could be shared for official purposes for research in order to, to improve the delivery of public services and for the prevention of crime. Mm. Uh, very broadly, I can't remember the exact wording, I'm afraid, uh, on the hoof. Um, so so, so th those, instead of having specific data gate gateways, as they're called, specific legal provisions by which information can be transferred from one place to another, now if information is held by any official body, it can be used for any of those three purposes, given 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 the the appropriate form filling, effectively box ticking. Um, if you want to know specifically about NHS opt outs and NHS uh, uh, use of data, that is a, that is a, a, another massive rabbit warren. But I can the best I can do there is to recommend that you all check out the website of Med Confidential run by my uh, old pal, uh, Phil Booth, who worked with me on No to ID. Uh, and they have done a massive amount of work teasing out exactly what the hell's going on. Uh, 
Uh, it's a it's a very very complicated story, uh, and uh, and I and, and I don't think I, I know enough about it to say anything more than go and have a look at people who do know what it's about. All right, uh, Tamandra, some thoughts. I, I'm glad you raised the uh, the the NHS data thing because I think that's a kind of classic. Mm. It's a classic case study of how not to do it. Basically, it's the, they call it the GPDPR. <laughs> <laughs> which is is kind of weird that they made it sound so much like GDPR, which people go vaguely. It's suspicious. Oh, really. yeah, that's <laughs> isn't that the the thing that safeguards my privacy rights? <laughs> like, well, this is completely different. This is your GP data. Now, um, so I mean, they, they just like did everything wrong. There, there was a whole thing called Care Dot Data several years ago where they went. This is a bit crazy that people's medical records are not joined up, and that if you end up in hospital they do automatically have access to all your medical records from your G GP, which is just crazy. I mean, what's the point of having a super joined up NHS if if you go into hospital and they go, who are you and you've ever had this before? I mean, it's just nuts. <laughs> uh, absolutely fair enough that they want to join that up. They also, uh, they also went, do you know what? We are pretty much unique in the world of having this comprehensive set of medical data about almost the whole population throughout the whole of their lives because we have the NHS. This is immensely valuable and it's valuable for research as a, you know, as a societal good, but it's also valuable in money terms because companies who want to do medical research will go, this is incredible. We could, you know, we can have just this wide, wide picture of a population uh, and look at and their medical histories and how valuable that would be. And the NHS, which is always strapped for cash, has said for several years, we really need to try and get some monetary value as well as societal value out of this data. That's not a secret. Uh, and, and, you know, I personally think it's kind of fair enough. They have all this valuable data. If, if you can use that to get either literal cash or go goods in kind from drug companies by letting them use that for research, you know, personally, I'm, I'm up for that. But what they did not do was either explicitly say, what we'll do is we'll put it in one of these trusted research environments so that your personal individual identifiable data will not be available to people from these companies to just like take home in a bag. Uh, they did not say, we are going to be transparent about exactly about which, which companies are going <laughs> to use it and for what, what will be the outcomes? Will it be only for medical research? Will it be for drug development? Will it be for health insurance research? Will it be for lifestyle research, for marketing? I mean, there's just, they put no limits on this. It was completely non-transparent. They tried to slide it out while we were all busy with the pandemic. And then when a few people like MediConfidential went, um, we see a few problems with this. Uh, you've made it really, really hard to opt out, but we're gonna help people do it. And they went, oh, we'll just take this away and bring it back a bit later. <laughs> We won't actually really get a proper debate going to make mm. these things clear. Uh, and, they, and then they've, they've taken it away again. I mean, the whole thing is like, please, there's so much value you could get out of all this health data. Like both for us as individuals having joined up records, for society and doing health research. If you want to, you know, you could get value for the NHS and put money in. I bet if you said to most people in the public, would you be willing for your data to be used for research in return for the NHS getting money, most people would go, hmm, well, yeah, you know, it's easier than clapping on your doorstep every Thursday, isn't it? <laughs> so in short, I mean, I think they've just like, it's a case study of how not to do it, basically. Uh, briefly, how has data been misused? I, I, I mean, I think, you know, you're right to distinguish between research and, and operational use of data. The one thing I think I would say is, the thing that it's consistently misused in is population-wide data is used to make predictions about individuals. And, mm -hmm. and one example I would give is uh, in the justice system, the policing system, they're, they're often trying to say, how can we predict who will reoffend, who should who should enter the, the punitive prison system and who shouldn't? And, uh, and they're trying to build databases and do that in more or less ethical ways, lots of different things going on. But there's too much saying, as a population, we can see these trends. Therefore, you as an individual, because of your postcode, you are 60% likely to reoffend. I'm a bit sensitive about this because of where I live. Uh, I would definitely be going down for a long time if they were using that uh, 
as a predictor. But I think there's too much of that goes on. I think there's too much saying we can we can say meaningful things about population and therefore we're going to apply it to you as an individual. I'm sorry I keep catching your eye. I'm not yeah. saying you're a criminal. I like your socks. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to, were you trying to add something? Brief? Yeah, yeah, can I just come back just to make the, uh, what Guy was saying about the digital economy act and what, what that was intended to, to solve. So before that, Guy was absolutely right. Um, use of administrative data had to be tied to a very specific um, uh, use as defined in law. So if you take HMRC tax data uh, and income data, you could only research, do research on that if it was to benefit the tax system. You could not do research on it to look at ethnic disparities in pay or you know, if uh, people from poor social backgrounds their pay trajectories are different from, you know, people from middle income, um, you know, uh, higher socioeconomic groups. You couldn't do that. You weren't allowed. With the Digital Economy Act, you can if it passes the public good test. Great. Uh, okay. There's still lots of answers. So there's, we'll have a longer round of questions this time. Okay. It's purple. Sorry. Uh, do you believe that um, for some types of data, despite having um, research value, there should never be kept or stored? Uh, and there's this this type of thing that then there should be some sort of regulation for this data not to be stored. Can I bring can I bring very very short, very quickly an example about this? And I don't know, probably everybody remembers the virus that brought down the NHS a couple of years ago. The story of that virus is very interesting because it started in NSA, and this is not a tinfoil hat conspiracy. It's a, it's a public information. NSA discovered that there was, there was a vulnerability in Windows 95, and it didn't go to Microsoft. They kept it and they said we are the good guys. Our computers are safe. We, we, this, there's no harm that can, can come out of this. Apparently, their basements were not so safe. Someone broke into the server, stole this, released the information on the internet, and people wrote a virus, virus, a virus about it. And the virus spread through the world in like 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours. So a big argument, a big debate was raised then. Is there some piece of information that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be in anyone's basement? Because you might believe you have safety measures, legal or technical, but the risk is just too high for this data to exist in the first place. Yeah. Good point. So I'm a final university student, and over summer I had an internship in one of the labs, and I was became intimately aware of uh, how to write ex ethic approvals, and uh, this well many of them didn't go through. At the same time, people from the industry like let us know how much more flexible with them it is, and uh, my question is like uh, why are the people who you could actually put like the academics who are actually interested in answering the questions you're asking, hampered so much and. Uh, um, the research is left with people uh, who are interested only in profit. Like, uh, why, why academics who should be, who would be able to answer those questions and put on a spotlight to everyone are hampered while the industry gets all the free dibs on everything? Yeah, a, a great question. Okay. Hi, yeah, my name's Gerard Hosier. When I go to the doctor, should I police what I tell my doctor? Um, because it will now be on a public record that will e inevitably be hacked. SolarWinds has made all our data accessible to any agents overseas or anywhere. So that's a really key point. And you know, ADR is about connecting the spine, uh, my spine, to you know, all the different agencies in the UK. Now, I never in my life have given consent for that to be shared. And we all talk about consent. My, I have not consented to my data being shared retrospectively and the fact that I you know there's a little tick box I can do with the NHS now doesn't mean that all that data that I didn't know was going to be repurposed in a it could be in an incredibly evil way in, in many instances I don't know what the companies that come to you are going to do I am amazed in 2001 or 2021 you of course talking to you Stan that you can say that data can be anonymized it can be de-anonymized. My CT scan is as unique as my fingerprint, right? Um, so all the agencies, are, are, all the sort of Googles and Facebooks and all that, they can use, and the phone companies, they can use the date, tag the date that I went to the hospital, that the, the test was done. That can be re-anonymized. Re um, my TFL card could be used the day I visited the hospital or the doctor. All of that can be done. And, you know, you have all the agencies, so you have education. Does that mean that something, a, a paper that a, so I wrote at school can be now used, say, if I went to China, I could be arrested because 
And I know that has happened to, in one of my cl classes with, um, uh, not LinkedIn, what, what's the uh, referee paper? But, you know, somebody has asked to see a paper of one of my students that was writing something challenging about another country. So, you know, the fact that you can sit there and say, well, you know, it's all benign and it's all for good, good intentions. And all the researchers are not necessarily benign. Universities are now fun. You know, many, many students are from countries that may be our adversaries one day. And they can do research. And I know in Australia, which already has the system going for, you know, connecting all the agencies, um, which can be accessed by, I think, 15 different agencies, including the police, you know, and that's for schools and medical. Um, you know, all the universities have access to this, and th theirs is to monetize, which I think is different to yours, um, to monetize it. And that gives countries that could be our adversaries to do research on Australians. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank right, you. Um, I'm going to mark myself out as the enemy here. I work in systems design, and we're in the midst of developing a project which would tie our large database in with an AI system. And this is so we can better sell products to people. <laughs> and I suppose in the course of this, this talk, I find a lot of um, our audience especially uh, perhaps paranoid about um, about data, when for corporate interests, we just want to sell more stuff to people. That's no different. That's always going to be the case. And we just have better tools to sell what people want, which to me seems like a good thing. Similarly, in the case of uh, scientific research, it seems really strange that we'd want to stop people from being able to better the world through scientific endeavors. And information is key to that. It almost seems sort of like a dark age I ideology where you want to forbid people from going out and gathering information and using the technology that we now have available. And I do share some of the concerns about totalitarianism. You know, I love Coca-Cola as well. I would be terrified if the government came in and said, we're going to ban it because uh, data says it's bad for you. But at least within the UK at the moment, we still, I believe, have the tools to, or the means to, to question the information that's gathered. And, and also, we vote for the party who, uh, who says Coca-Cola's OK. Or we don't, because we agree with that analysis. And I think there's a little bit too much paranoia. And it is completely conversely. I think a lot of it is pretty benign and uh, useful. And it seems strange to be so frightened of something so useful. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. Really useful. Hello. So. I'm not going to give you a long resume, but just very briefly by way of background. I'm a physician with an additional uh, educational background in IT. I was a um, visiting professor in epidemiology at one of the American universities and have been teaching public health at Berkeley for quite a long time. But my primary life has been commercial. And I was part of the senior management team that built a company that makes clinical guidelines, which are then used to advise people on how better to take care of patients. In doing that, we used to make extensive use of public databases um, that have been gathered in the course of people receiving care on a day-to-day -day basis right the way across the United States. Everything I'm describing, by the way, is all my American experience. I'm British, but I'm also American. And it seems to me that the question of can data be used ethically and for good is very clearly, yes, it can. Um, I happen also to have made a reasonable amount of money out of it. Now, whether that makes me a bad guy or a good guy, I really don't know. Um, I throw in a couple of other sort of things. Some lead, one of them is slightly anecdotal. Um, I think we can very easily underestimate the stupidity of technology. One of my uh, one of my friends was doing some research on bioterrorism surveillance using publicly available data across the United States. And one of the early uh, pieces of work they did successfully detected what they believed to be an outbreak of gastric flu in a particular state in the United States. When they further dug into researching what was actually going on there, what they discovered was that they discovered a two-for-one promotion in one of the large pharmacies for anti-diarrheal medication. <laughs> the other anecdote that some of you may know is um, Target 
does a lot of work with big data to help its promotional activity and got into a certain amount of hot water with the father of a 15 or 16 year old girl mm -hmm. to whom they began sending information about her impending, preg uh, impending uh, childbirth. Um, and the father was furious, Just my daughter, she's only 16. How as it happens, it turns out she actually was pregnant and she hadn't told her father yet. Um, but Tesco, um, Tesco, Target knew this long before the father did and before anybody in that family had had a chance to talk about it. All of that was done with publicly available data, which people are just gathering in the course of going about, or giving out in the course of going about their lives. So I think I'll just finish with one very sort of quick point, which is, in some ways, I think you've already lost control of all of this. It's out there. It's everywhere. The techniques are there. The tools are there. The data is there. Everything you do, you're scattering data all around you all the time. And unless you're prepared to really radically change the way you live, completely change the way you use things like social media, computers, cell phones, you've lost control of this already. And let, you know, you've got to give up your, your, your grocery store cards, your nectar cards, your airline cards. Um, Otherwise, this stuff's out there. There's not that much you can do about it. Great, thanks. Thanks. I think I just wanted to add to this point about trust. Um, a couple of things were mentioned that are done to try and help people have trust in governments and researchers. So like consent, and uh, you talked about some kind of public panels, forums, stuff like that. I'd just love to hear a bit more about some of those the mechanisms that are used to try and build that trust and could maybe make it possible for uh, people to see a bit more eye to eye. Yeah, great. I mean, in part this, I think, is part part the answer, but that's what we like to think we're doing. Hi there. Um, as, as a quick aside, I think people would be less paranoid about marketing data if they knew how arse-clenchingly poor you know, <laughs> most of the, the use of it is. Yes, yes. As, um, uh, but as a sort of uh, key point, I, I wonder if there's something about the ethics of non-intervention. So, you know, if a researcher is digging through my health record and says, oh, this chap is 80% likely to have a fatal heart attack in the next 12 months, you know, should I tell them or should I finish, uh, write the research study, wait for it to be published, hoping it's adapted into public policy, and then eventually, in about five years' time, a doctor's surgery might map my record against this new policy and say, oh, well, we could have saved him four years ago if we'd actually known. So maybe there's a question about stuff that would be good to know if somebody would tell us. Yeah, good, great question. Um, as the uh, gentleman at the front said about data being re re um, un anonymized <laughs> and saying about CT scans is very individualistic. Um, Tamandra mentioned about uh, saying you can remove the identifier for a person, but what about technologies like facial recognition, which with that sample, you can always recognize that person again, even if you don't have their name, you can find them anywhere in the country and you can track them. Now, is there any technologies like that that should not be ever used because of their potential ultravirus, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, their possible implications later down the line. And even if, let's say, our government could never become totalitarian over here, uh, <laughs> our innovations that are made in the UK can still be used by other more authoritarian countries in the future. And do we have a responsibility for our innovations being used in other countries? Like yeah, great. No, yeah, we need to get into this issue of de of de anonymized Somebody's gonna have to tell me which is it unanonymized, whatever it is. Someone's gonna have to tell me whatever it is. And and then and then yeah, what is it? D on miss anyway. Um <laughs> and and also then this question, are there some kinds of data that like we should just stay away from like some classes we should stay away from altogether? My history is I'm a, was the legal director for one of the mobile operators and one of my responsibilities was setting data protection and the protections around how we used of an extraordinarily rich data sets. Um, which is very highly regulated and, and making those kinds of decisions. Um, my experience was that we had to constantly to make sort of moral and ethical judgments as to what was and should and shouldn't be used from our data sets. There were huge commercial pressures, huge value from, from what we had. Um, and we took those decisions very conscientiously and very carefully. Um, but we had to make decisions because the law and uh, is, is way behind in terms of the, the principles it gives are incredibly useful and very good at guiding us th through that decision-making process. But the, um, the decisions themselves would often be about features and technology and, que and questions, capabilities, 
that simply most people in the, in, in, the, in the nation would not understand as the kind of functionality that can be delivered from big data. And a huge amount of it is, is, is beneficial and hugely life-affirming, so I'm going to support the idea that there's a lot of good to come from it. But I guess my question is, is back to what's the reality of, of I do think that sort of people are spewing out this data all over the place. They're consenting to it constantly, constantly consenting every time they press a click through, every time they go on the internet, every time they use Google, they've, they've agreed to a ton of data being going out to them. All of us are phenomenally well profiled and very, very predictable, um, slightly sadly for anyone uh, who, who likes to think of themselves as an individual. Um, so the question I suppose is, goes back to, is this really a matter for national policy and, and or actually is the reality that this information is managed and governed by bigger organisations than even me as a mobile operator, um, legal director, but goes back to Google, um, Facebook and other other large companies that really set the global agenda um, and are beyond the scope of a, a conversation like this. It's great. The, the early point of your point, I think, was very useful for the panel to reflect on. It's like you can always just say big business and bad order, but it's often like you forget there's like real people working it out as it happens in a way that is way ahead of maybe where the politicians are. So that's a great question. Um, I'm really sorry to be back on the mic again. Um, <laughs> just to um, return to something that Emma said about that certain groups not opting out especially because you don't want to have homogenous data set. Um, as probably the only black woman in this room, I am very identifiable because <laughs> a lot of personal data will have your gender and your ethnicity. So even if it was anonymized in the sense it doesn't have my name or my address or my date of birth, for example, if I said something and I was tagged as the black woman said this, I know that people wouldn't say that. Um, anyone in this room would be able to identify who said that. Um, so that's probably just one area that needs work and I think that's difficult. Um, and then the point about, uh, someone made some, a, a point about um, the legal system is a bit far behind. So in the US, Palant Palantir, which is probably one of the big data companies, I mean, um, I, I think that they can do good work and they obviously can do things that are quite controversial with um, ICE being one of the things that they were notably um, critiqued for. And their CEO made a very like good point, which was that we don't set the like state of things that need to be done. It's a political thing. We just accept the contracts. And I think that it becomes quite difficult when citizens can't necessarily engage on that level. Um, so how do you balance that? This is something that the government thought that was for the public good, because they are securing their borders. But, but on a public level, it seemed that it wasn't, it didn't have very much support. No, yeah, great point. Predictive health, I think, is one of the key things that you're talking about, um, or, or hoping that research will uncover uh, predictive health models that will help people. But there's also, it can also uncover pr predictive policing. Um, and they are very much the same thing, predictive policing, predictive health. And it's the thin edge of the wedge. Now, there is a code word for predictive policing, and in fact, predictive health, and it's prejudice. And I think that lady who was speaking earlier, she was, that's a kind of like the implication of what she was saying, is that prejudice against people who have a certain genetic disposition, for example, because genetic health like, will be probably used um, for um, medicine prediction, or, or because um, genetics is very good for determining how some medicines work. Um, so there, there's a, a large chance that our genes will become part of the health system. It's already, mm -hmm. anyway, uh, yeah. I'll finish. Uh, yeah, and that's really, I just want to make sure that um, discrimination can be part yeah. of the problem. So this is uh, for Tracy. You talked about the West wanting to mirror China. Uh, and obviously right now we are under threat that vaccine passports or COVID certification passes will be mandated. So I wanted to hear your thoughts and those of the other panelists. Um, Yes, what do you make of this? And do you think that there will be mission creep and that we will see something like a COVID pass turned into a health pass, turned into a social credit system, et cetera? Thank you. 
Okay, great. No, we, we've I've let that run on um, a little longer than maybe I ought to, but it was really good. But not because that's kind of like the whole point of we're having this discussion is it's supposed to be a, a public one. What I'll do is I'll get you to sum up and that'll kind of close the session. And obviously we can't answer all these questions here. We can pick out a few things that are interesting. Um, we can suggest a few ways that we would like to sort of take this in the future. Or else we can't finish this and this is only the start of uh, a, a conversation as everyone keeps noting um and emma mentioned in her opening is a conversation we need to open up more so it's the gl very glad that we've made a start today but anyway uh tracy so thank you so just quickly um <laughs> i agree with a lot of what's been said and as someone who worked in advertising for 20 years and the mobile phone industry for 10 years <laughs> i feel your pain um <laughs> I am paranoid. I'm not paranoid about the data. This is to Samantha's first point, actually. I'm paranoid about the agendas behind it. And I, um, maybe I'm just a paranoid person anyway, but I, I fear that this, this kind of data used in the wrong way is going to be used to control the population rather than to understand the population. So my question really is, as I've been thinking as you've been speaking, is what are the safeguards or what are the places within the process that we can go almost back to the public. Maybe it's not about de-anonymizing um, de data. Maybe we almost need to go back to the person and do a check and ask something. I feel like it's the data. It goes off to um, a research facility. And the person that the data emanated from is anonymized, of course, for reasons we've discussed. But is that actually right? Maybe we should be bringing the public back into it at some point. I don't know. It's just a question. And the other thing it made me think as you were talking was we tried to define data and talk about that, but actually what is research? What is research these days? Because when I think about your point about um, Apple wanting to diagnose whether we are depressed through our iPhone, that's a huge platform for research. And then what happens to that, regardless of how it gets used back to me as an individual, um, I'm betting that the UK government, for example, would want all that data and it would want the analysis. And then how does that feed into sort of, you know, public good, etc. So I don't know what we now define as research really these days, once we've got tech companies um, involved. Um, but the main point was I was thinking, how on earth do we go back to people to almost go back in and check and talk and discuss um, this somehow? Um, because I feel like the public are kind of left out of it. Um, and I know there's good intentions for that um, in, in certain respects. Um, just to finish up your point about COVID passports, um, in the last session, actually, I spoke on the social credit system. <laughs> um, so I very much think digital identity and um, health passports, COVID passports are very different things. The first one's like a transactional identifying system. The second is a, a morality system. Personally, I think the COVID passport is a the creeping of a morality system which could not necessarily will, it's not inevitable, but could turn into a social credit system, yes. And I think the way in which it's come in to our society in the UK is interesting because the NHS is talked about in such an emotional, moralistic kind of way. As I said before, I think it is the weak spot for a social credit pathogen to access this country. And so I do think there is, and we should be vigilant. Great, thanks, Tracy. Um, Emma, some thoughts to wrap us up. So much. Yes. <laughs> right. So I'll I'll try and touch on uh, all uh, people's questions. So uh, first of all, we're not creating a spine. There is no you know mystical spine off which all other data hangs off. That's not what we're about. And if I uh, come to the kind of de-identified, anonymized uh, mm. data question. People talk about anonymized data in terms of removing things like NHS number or um, uh, name and address, and then you know uh, that then the data uh, doesn't have those variables. That's anonymized data. If you send that data out to a researcher, there is a chance that they could do some clever fuzzy matching techniques on it and potentially try to re-identify mm -hmm. that data. So when we're talking about data that's held in the trusted research environments that we're talking about, we talk it, about it being um, de-identified. So you take away those identifiers, but because it can't be taken out of that environment in that form, it's also functionally anonymized because you can't do that fuzzy matching against another data set. And crucially, because of the Digital Economy Act, if a researcher tried to do that, 
that would be against the law and you could be put into jail for doing that. So, so the only things that can be taken out of the system are the outputs from statistical analyses and all of that is individually checked by real people to make sure that nothing is getting out of the system. So just that that's quite important. So that comes back to the question about, you know, could you re-identify somebody, you know, inadvertently just because they're in a minority group? That's exactly what that, that system is, is in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and that kind of touches on the facial recognition point. And we, we're not holding that type of data in the environments that we're looking, uh, that, that we fund. But if you did, and if you tried to, uh, attempted to re-identify that data to real people, you, you'd be breaking the law. And what I'm trying to sort of put forward is, yes, there is a lot of mistrust around how this data has been used, but we've got a really good model for how to do research mm -hmm. on this data. And if we do work with the public, and for example, Scotland and Wales, with the, the uh, every single project that is uh, accredited and goes ahead, it's not just a group of experts that uh, make a judgment about that, it's a public panel. And they advertise for new members of these panels all the time, it has to pass the public panel as well. There's different models of doing it in different countries of the UK, but that's just one way in which I'm saying it, the public are most definitely involved in those decisions about what is being done in the public good. And if, if we build this kind of positive neural network for how to use data ethically and sen sensibly and safely, then more people will use that route and there'll be a more public discussion about it and more open debate about it. And there'll be less of this kind of cloak and dagger you know, paranoia about what the government might be doing with data. But um, uh, yeah, and the, the thing I'd finish on is the programme that I lead is all about getting better evidence to inform policy making right across all four countries of the UK. And without evidence, we're just less w left with conviction politics. And that's, that does nobody any good, essentially. So we have to find safe and secure and ethical ways to do this. And I think we've now got a model for doing that. Great, thanks. I'm really useful. Uh, guys, some closing thoughts. Um, my, my thoughts on uh, anonymization are, are, yes, fine. Having a, a, a sealed container approach is mm -hmm. fine. Uh, uh, anonymized data is a bit like sterilized milk. It's, 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 it's fine as long as you don't open it up. Uh, the, 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 the issue is not inadvertent de-anonymization. The issue is deliberate uh, de-anonymization for, for, for large uses of, of, of data. Now, on that score, I don't have a great deal of paranoia about gigantic corporations. Uh, I don't mind if Tesco wants to sell me cheese. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that gives me no, no problem at all. What I worry about is the relationship between uh, people who want to do good things for me and people who want to do good things to me. Uh, the difference being that I decide whether things are being done for me that I want. And I don't get a much choice in what things are being done to me with the benefit of evidential research or not. Great, thanks, Guy. Uh, Tamandra, your closing thoughts. Okay, uh, won't cover everything, obviously. Um, I want to pick up on the biometrics thing, the, the facial recognition thing. I, I think that's that's very important because I think, for me, there's an important distinction between biometric data, which is data about the body, and other kinds of data. I mean, somebody raised genetic data earlier, but the thing about genetic data is you do actually have to have some physical contact with somebody's body to get hold of it. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, whereas by with facial recognition technology, you can just walk down the street and it can be captured, and then you know, as whoever was said, it's it's on file forever. I think, and and it can never be separated from you. I think that's that's the thing, and we should actually be quite careful about how that's used. I remember talking a while ago to some school bursars who, and I said to them, so you know, there's this new thing where you can get a little little RFID chip 
like the one in the oyster carby and you can stick it under the skin of the hand and you know you could do that to all your kids so they could pay for their school lunches and they were obviously horrified of course they were mm. they were like what we wouldn't we'll microchip our kids we couldn't do that that would be ridiculous <clears throat> and i went yeah okay but the thing is when they left your school you just take the chip out whereas what you are doing is you're using fingerprints you use the kids fingerprints to pay for their school lunches that's those are the kids fingerprints for life you've got lifetime biometric data of those kids do you not think you should be thinking that through a bit more and you can see the little faces go oh i've never actually <laughs> thought of it that way yeah um so i do think i do think and that kind of brings us to the de-anonymization thing now i think that it, it's absolutely true if you have a, a few quite widely available bits of information about somebody it's very easy to de-anonymize them i mean you're obviously right if you're a minority population in a relatively small population incredibly easy to be identified again uh which is why you know, in practice, the civil service, for example, spend a lot of time scrambling up their data so that you cannot look at a, a, a school in North Wales and say, well, we know there are only two ethnic minority kids, so we know who they are. Um, so, you know, a lot of it goes into that. But I, I think to some extent, you have to ask yourself, who who is going to be bothered enough to de-identify you and track you as an individual when it, all this stuff is so readily out there anyway for most of us with any kind of social media presence so I, I think there is a degree to which you go should I worry about this that much unless uh, I am personally vulnerable unless I'm Kathleen Stock and people are literally making threats against my life for example uh, but but in general I think we should worry less about that and more about the overall effect on us of of the results of um, of of research and who has control over it. I think there's, there's a very interesting little thing about the the move to give you more control over your individual, your personal data. Like, for example, Apple saying, we're going to keep all the data on your phone and it'll be your data and you have control over it and you have to give explicit consent. And we all go, this is what I'm talking about. My data is now private. It's mine. Apple, let me control it. And, and what Apple are doing is it's basically they're treating it like a mini trusted research environment so Apple will put their algorithms in and the algorithms will get improved and the results will come out and Apple won't know you individually they'll just know the improvements in the algorithms this means Apple have basically monopolized all the research that's going to be done on all of our data on our iPhones so who has control of that Apple Apple do it's not available for research for anybody else so I think this I think this comes back to who has control I, I think you know citizens panels I, I'm a great believer in actually we should have much more direct democratic oversight in how data is used i think i think vaccine passports are quite worrying i think because they set up essentially the basis of a uh, digital id system which could be repurposed which could very easily have biometric i mean i i i don't know how it works but i think you have, to have a photo on it so it's basically a biometric id digital id system uh I again I think there should have been a bit more discussion about a national digital ID system with biometric identification before it was brought in uh, maybe call me old-fashioned mm -hmm. and I would just like to see more more very direct you know more more citizens panels more public involvement more very direct involvement of us in deciding what is done with data and how it's used great uh, so can we thank the panel a really interesting stuff. <laughs>